scientific greatness. The design of structures can be seen as an integral aspect of cultural heritage, influenced by its distinctive architectural style, location, and purpose. This is why many of us can look to huts, to clay huts, and feel some kind of connection to a people who are long gone. It's all part of our heritage. And so, when people discuss South African heritage, we live in South Africa, so therefore we should discuss South African heritage. They could refer to anything from the breathtaking mountains of KwaZulu-Natal to the grape-flowing winelands of the Western Cape, the vibrant shreshwe fabric to the bright color-blocking geometric patterns of Chivenda, the beloved bunny chow or the culinary war on who makes the best cook sister. <laughs> and my vote is Cape Malay. Yeah. But we'll leave it there. I love it. It has to be proven though. Please bring. Extravagant fellowship. Please, no, say that. Heritage is an intensely personal journey, evolving uniquely for each individual, but caught up in the communal aspect of who we And so therefore, we could summarize by saying heritage is language, culture, and ethnicity. Heritage is pain and joy. Heritage is defeat and victory. Heritage is cuisine, music, fashion, and art. Heritage is past, present, and the hope of a bright future. All of it is heritage. And so if that is the case, then, then we must ask the question, can the gospel impact the complexity of heritage? If we're going to say, my goodness, that, that sounds so complex. There's so much to dive into. There's so much to take apart. Can the gospel impact all of it? Or is it easier for us to simply leave heritage alone? Because where does one even begin? Maybe... Maybe that's why it's easier for us to, to reach people with the good news of the gospel. But in doing so, here's what we do. We teach them our language. We teach them our culture. We teach them our preferences, imposing the gospel as if like that is the gospel. No, those are just your personal preferences. I want us to think about this for a moment. For, for some reason, the church thought, and look, I'm not bashing those who have come before us. We ourselves need to examine our own hearts and, and, and evaluate what it is that we are doing. But, but does it make sense to show up in a context and go, you know what, instead of me trying to understand your heritage and seeing how I might be able to apply the gospel, no, we say, learn my heritage so that you might hear the gospel. And so maybe we teach them English and tell them to stop playing drums and stop dancing. We tell them to put on a particular kind of clothing and to talk in the way that Shakespeare would talk so that you might actually align with the gospel. And hear me, I have no problem with Shakespeare. I love Othello. <laughs> I do. But, but, but we must understand how then do we navigate the spaces that we then f now find ourselves in where we do speak the language that we speak and we live the way that we live. H how does it make sense for me to be able to go, I am speaking to an individual who is from a particular tribe and context and also loves sushi. It's all heritage. And we do this without elevating these preferences to the point where they are on the same level as the gospel. It's difficult. This is why I asked the question, can the gospel impact this heritage that so many of us possess, that's so complex? And I know many of us would go, yes! 
But do our lives reveal that? The gospel of Jesus Christ allows us to rejoice in what is good, to see redemption in what is broken, and to reject what is evil. And we have to do the hard work of navigating through that. A simple blanket, this is too difficult, too hard. You know what? I'm not going to take the time, just do my way, must come to an end because it reveals that we do not believe in the power of the gospel. Like I said, the gospel, the gospel allows us to see what is good. There are so many things here that are good, that are from the very hand of God. And so we must figure out ways, how do we honor one another in that? How how do we humble ourselves and ask the question, what, what, what is this good thing that God has placed in your particular heritage, in your particular context, in your particular upbringing? The gospel allows us to do that. We must open our eyes to it. The gospel also allows us to see redemption in what is broken. And so therefore, we must press into the gospel to be able to see the truth of the gospel and apply the truth of the gospel and to move into difficult spaces and to see the grace of Jesus' work. But also, the gospel allows us to reject what is evil. And there we ask for the power of the gospel to give us boldness and courage to speak against the evil, against the kingdom of darkness, even if it's part of our heritage. And so can the gospel impact the complexity of our heritage. Yes, but show me in scripture on it. No problem. This is where we come to Psalm 22. The second half of Psalm 22. You see, it, it describes the ministry of the risen Christ. The power of the gospel in every heritage. And so let me read you this whole thing. And then what we'll do is we'll dance between the various verses. Remembering that this, this was written in a, in a very poetic way. And so Psalm 22, from verse 22, hear these words of our Father. I will proclaim your name to my brothers and sisters. I will praise you in the assembly. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you descendants of Jacob, honor him. All you descendants of Israel, revere him. For he has not despised or abhorred the torment of the oppressed. He did not hide his face from him, but listened when he cried to him for help. I will give Praise in the great assembly because of you. I will fulfill my vows because those who fear you. The humble will eat and be satisfied. Those who seek the Lord will praise him. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord. All the families of the nations will bow down before you. For the kingship belongs to the Lord. He rules the nations. All who prosper on earth will eat and bow down. All those who go down to the dust will kneel before him. Even the one who cannot preserve his life. Their descendants will serve him. The next generation will be told about him. They will come and declare his righteousness to a people yet to be born. They will declare what he has done. Among the many things that we can see in these verses, the one big one that speaks to our Sunday, Heritage Sunday, as we look to Heritage Day, is this, that the gospel impacts geographically, intergenerationally, ethnically, culturally, and socioeconomically. The gospel impacts geographically, intergenerationally, ethically, ethnically, culturally, and socioeconomically. Let's look at this. The gospel has geographic impact. Verses 22 to 25. What we see here is that, is that all of this, all, all this work that, that, that God is doing uh, in this particular context, we're told starts in the temple, but it expands to the ends of the earth. Verse 22 says, I will proclaim your name to my brothers and sisters. I will praise you in the assembly. Jump with me to verse 27. He then says, all the ends of the earth will remember. So, so it starts in the assembly, but then he goes, and, and, and all the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord. All the families of the nations will bow down before you. What, why will they do this? Verse 28, for kingship belongs to the Lord. He rules the nations. 
God's always had the nations on his heart. It's not just a New Testament thing. It's not just because Paul started writing letters to churches and saying, guys, the dividing wall of hostility has been broken. That's not where it started. God has always had the nations on his heart. He starts in a particular place, but he goes, this, this thing must expand. This thing must grow. It cannot just stay local. It must go global. Abraham Kuyper says this. He says, there is not a square inch in the whole domain of our human existence over which Christ, who is sovereign over all, does not cry, mine. And so he looks at South Africa and he goes, mine. He looks at Africa and he goes, mine. He looks at Uganda and he goes, mine. He, he looks at the, the Middle East. I'm sure many of us, we've given up on the Middle East. We're, we're cry, come, that's what we're, we just cry, come Jesus, come, come Lord. It's too much, we can't take it. But, but he looks there and he goes, mine. There is a way to engage there. And, and we must take the time to not just go, you know what, it's me coming over, changing everything, here's my preferences. No, 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 the, the, the Lord already said mine long ago. He has a plan. We should know that we can go anywhere in the world with the gospel and know that the Lord has gone before us. And if he has gone before us, then he has assured victory for us. But do we believe? It's one thing to say yes. It's a whole other thing to take steps of obedience in that direction. So it impacts geographically, but it it impacts intergenerationally as well. Let's go back to verse 22. It says, I will proclaim... Your name to my brothers and sisters. I will praise you in the assembly for the following. We go to verse 29. All who prosper on earth will eat and bow down. All those who go down to the dust, so those who've died, will kneel before him. Even the one who cannot preserve his life. That's you and me. And so there's, there's those who've gone to the dust, but now he's like, he's like, let's talk about you guys in the room. None can secure or preserve his natural life longer than God is pleased to continue with it. I I hope we know that. That that God is the author of our lives, but he's also the sustainer of our lives. So he has control over that as well. Verse 30, their descendants will serve him. The next generation will be told about the Lord. Lord. They will come and declare his righteousness to a people yet to be born. So so now he's throwing in the unborn. He's going, there's those who've died. God's got a plan. There's those of us in the room. God's got a plan. And those who are yet to be born, God's got a plan. They will declare what he has done. All of history is bound together by the bookends of God's love. All, all of history. Front to back, it finds itself in the saving works of Jesus Christ. All of God's work is is intergenerational. And I I know some of us, we go, you know what, this is the generation. There's a massive war between like a millennial, Gen X, baby boomers. Like I don't even, I have no idea. I've gotten to a point where I'm like, I have no idea what my kids are. And they keep asking me, like, what am I? I'm like, I don't know, I don't know. You guys are weird. But all of it, all of it is in God's plans. Here's another way to say it. From womb to tomb. From womb to tomb, the gospel impacts. And so when we talk about generation after generation after generation, and as we see culture change and heritages change and evolve, God's just, he's looking, he's not caught by surprise. I know we are. We're trying to figure out, like, what am I going to tell my kids? Because I grew up in a context where it's like we had to put a, a whole thing on a wheelbarrow and wheel the thing all the way to where we get water, and the whole village had to figure out how to do that. My kids just go in the morning and open it, and you know what they do? They just leave it open. <laughs> we got to figure out how to navigate through that. But what I'm telling you is that the gospel has gone ahead of us. The gospel has a plan for you kids. 
and your grandkids and your great grandkids. And by grace, for some reason, God goes, you know what, I'm going to rope you guys in so that you can play a role in this. They'll have no idea who you are. They won't. So we're so trying to build names for ourselves. 200 years from now, no one will care who you are. Some of y'all 10 years from now. But that's, that's cool. But we're told here, they will come and declare his righteousness. They will declare what he has done. What has he done? What is he doing now in you? Intergenerational impact. The gospel can impact ethnically and culturally. There's a big one. Ethnically and culturally. Again, let's go back to verse 22. I will proclaim your name. I love that. I love the fact that we're starting that way. I will proclaim your name. Isn't that a great way to start anything that you do? I have all these plans and this is what I want to do. And we want to plant churches and we want to reach these people and, and, we, and we want to break generational curses and we want, to, we, want to, we want to all these things. But we start with I will proclaim your name. Amen. Why do you think we start that way on a Sunday gathering here at Rooted Fellowship? We start by proclaiming the name. I will proclaim your name to my brothers and sisters. I will praise you in the assembly. So some translations say in the congregation. David, the author of this song, is talking about his fellow Hebrew brothers and sisters here. I'm going to praise God for your goodness. And so he's, think about it, think about it. He's just looking around. These are my people of my tribe. My brothers and my sisters, my cousins, and my, these are my people. So he starts there. But he doesn't stop there. He expands to the nation of Israel, to the other tribes. Verse 23 says, you who fear the Lord, praise him. All you descendants of Jacob, honor him. So now he's going off to all the tribes. All you descendants of Israel, in case you didn't know, revere him. But he doesn't stop there. He doesn't just stop with Israel. He goes, no, God's, he's always been making the circle bigger. He includes the nations. All the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord. All the families of the nations will bow down before, before you. He, he, he's, I mean, I know we read this and we, we think geographic, but, but I want us to double click and to, to really recognize what God is doing in the complexity of heritage here. He, he, he's going, listen, it's not just about where they live, but it's also about who they are. If, if you read the letters to the churches that Paul wrote, a lot of the issues had to do with ethnic and cultural issues. Yes, there was a lot of theological strange things that he had to call out, a lot of evil that was happening there from a doctrinal perspective, but he was also going, hey guys, so you guys are trying to figure out whether to eat bacon or not. Oof. Oh, which, which holiday you want to celebrate? Okay, let's, let's talk a little bit about that. Can you imagine that? Like having to deal with all that complexity, like even in this very room. Like we could walk out of here and some people are going, oh, but, but my song wasn't sang in my language. <laughs> it's a real thing. And yet we're told here that while we sit here and wrestle with one another and try to figure out how to make it work and can it work, the gospel's going, uh, uh, yes. Yes, the power of the gospel can engage that. It figures out how to, to bring people from all walks of life because God has always been about the nations. In his creative genius, what, you think that like, the way that you do things is because you came up with it? It's in his creative genius that he, that he gives us culture and ethnicity and different ways of doing things. But those things should never get in the way of the gospel. The gospel's impact doesn't stop with one people group or one culture. Its power extends to all the nations. That's why in John's vision of heaven in Revelation 7 verse 9, he sees a great multitude. Guys, you've got to read these words. A great 
multitude, and then he goes on to say that no one could count. He, like, it's blowing his mind. Like, he's, he's up there and he's going, like, what on earth is going on here? What is happening here? Why are these people here? You know, one of the reasons that the church, um, there, there was five reasons, I don't have time to get into them, that historians have documented on why the church had so much impact. Now, again, many of us, we say Constantine one day gave his life to Jesus, which is very possible. Not against that. God can do whatever he wants. But historians are going, they, they, there was also this thing called the church. And we were trying to make sense of it. And it was coming through. I mean, like the Roman Empire couldn't, couldn't figure it out. But, and one of the things the church was known for was what they called its shared table. That there was, there was this, this group of people who come from different walks of life, but were sharing the same table. They were fellowshipping together and it made no sense to the people back then. You guys are supposed to hate each other. And yet here we are breaking bread with one another. A great multitude, John says, that no one could count from every nation, from every tribe, from every people, and from every language. When people ask me, Anna, why are you so passionate about this idea of a transcultural church? Like, why does it matter? I go, hey guys, it's not, like I'm just continuing what I see in the scriptures. I'm just trying to be obedient to what I see in the scriptures. Now, now we could have a whole other conversation about, well, this church looks this way and this church, no problem, we can talk about that. But right now, I'm talking to you. Because you're in the room. The reason I'm passionate about it is because this is our eternal reality. So we might as well get comfortable now. It impacts ethnically and culturally. But also the, the gospel impacts socioeconomically. Now this is a real tough one. It's a real tough one. But it impacts socioeconomically. Verse 26, the, the humble... Other translations would say the afflicted, the poor, the miserable, the, the meek, those who are low in society. The, the humble will eat and be satisfied. Those who seek the Lord will praise him. May your hearts live forever. Jump with me to verse 29. And then, then it says, so it's got, it's got so here's the humble, here's the poor, here's the, the miserable, the meek. Uh, but, but then it goes, verse 29, all who prosper, those who have wealth and possessions, on earth will eat and bow down. I find it interesting. Now, there's various ways to interpret this, and many people have interpreted it in various ways, but we all come back to the same thing in that, listen, this, this, what's happening here is going, listen, rich or poor, it's bringing us all to the same place, and that is bowing before the sovereign God. There will be an equality of satisfaction and worship. An equality of satisfaction and worship, regardless of your socioeconomic class. All will be humbled in reverence before the Lord. All of us, doesn't matter what you're wearing, what car you drive, where you live, we're all going to bow. And none of us are going to be looking at what name is on the back of your shirt. I'm telling you, it will pale in comparison to the one we bow before. And so if that is our eternal reality, why are we not getting used to it now? We're so fixated on like, oh, so, but what do you do and where do you live? And, and, and even the questions we ask, what do you do? So, sometimes in there, now I know some of y'all is genuine because your heart's right and you love Jesus and it's amazing. <laughs> but, but, but when we ask that, it's because it's we've, we've, we've looked up and down a few times. It's because we saw the car you came in with. And so now we're wondering, so, what? What do you do? <laughs> Trying to figure out, is, is the, like, should, how close should I be to you? Yeah. Instead of going, how close can I be to the Lord? I love this idea of shalom. I know we talk about peace. In a sense, what, what we're seeing here, what, what, what David is prophetically writing and, and, and what we are reading today in light of the, the victory of Jesus Christ, the, this, this reality that we're going, like, like this is what life is going to be like. It's, it's, it's shalom. Shalom. Amy Sherman says this, shalom is the, the webbing together of God, humans, 
and all creation in justice, fulfillment, and delight. This is why I include landscapes, like, like structures, because Romans tells us that, that creation is groaning. Because Gro- it's, it's going, guys, this is not the original design. Think about that for a moment. Rivers, rivers are groaning, going, this is not, what this is not how it's supposed to be flowing. The mountains, the mountains are just going, guys, when will the children of God do what they're supposed to do? Because this is not how it's supposed to be. And you think that that doesn't shape us? Shalom is the webbing together of God, humans, and all creation in justice, fulfillment, and delight. We call it peace, but it means far more than mere peace of mind or ceasefire among enemies. In the Bible, shalom means universal flourishing, wholeness, and delight. That's what the gospel does. It ushers in universal flourishing, wholeness, and delight from a people who come from different walks of life, who look different and think different. But how is this possible, Anna? I hear you, you're super passionate, this is great, but how is this possible? Because look, we live in a real world. And real things happen in a real world. But we also have a real God. And a real God does real things through the power of the gospel. So how is this possible? Well, well, I could go to so many places, but let me go to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 4 to 6, where it says, because we are one body, with one spirit, under one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one Father, who is in all and through all. How is it possible? Because we bow before one Lord. Unless we're saying otherwise. But why should all of this matter to a believer in Jesus Christ? Why should it matter to the church? Why, why as we think about Heritage Day, why should we not only remember, but reflect so that we can press in to the gospel. Like, why? Why, why, why is this important? Oh, no, you could have preached on anything this Sunday. But why take a moment to unpack heritage and then to show us how the gospel impacts everything? Why? Well, let's make it super specific. It's because we live in South Africa. And I know many of us in the room may not have been born here, but we've come here, but you live here. God has placed you here for this particular season. We live in uh, South Africa, and for a long time, this country was referred to, and I still think still is, as the Rainbow Nation. Many reasons for why. But post-1994, South Africa has been known as the Rainbow Nation, that the, 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 there is a dream, there is a dream of a rainbow nation. But as I interact with people and engage with people, even Christians, it's left me wondering, was this just a figment of our imagination? What was this dream just like an idea that someone thought was really, really cool, but in reality, it'll never work? The real question that we're asking is, is all hope lost? That's the question. Is all hope lost? Friends, hear this. God put the first rainbow in the sky as a beacon of hope for Noah. Because of Jesus, we still have reason to look to that rainbow. Because of Jesus, we can still have hope. This side of heaven, we can still have hope. There are two places that I go to. I mean, all of this is good, but there are two particular places that I go to. Whenever I go, man, this is getting too hard. And this is not easy. I'm telling you this. I mean, planning a church, just leading a church, just being a part of a church, contributing to the church, like all of it, all that you do in of itself is not easy because, because there, is a, there is a whole kingdom that hates what we do. The fact that we have gathered like this this Sunday, there is a whole kingdom that cannot stand it. That every week they hope something's gonna happen so that it breaks this. And so that alone, this is hard. 
And then you go, okay, but we, God, how, how might we press into this universal flourishing and wholeness and delight? How, how, how might we press in in such a way that we are actually seeing the gospel impact geographically and intergenerationally and ethnically and culturally and socioeconomically, that, that the gospel impacts heritage? Now, that's a whole nother thing. And so when things get hard, where, where, where do we go? Well, one of the places I love to go to is Acts 17. It says, from one man, he has made, this is God, he has made every nationality to live over the whole earth. He has made. Oof. So much could be said here. He has made. What does that mean, pastor? It means that there are no mistakes in this room. Now we can talk about how you got here. No problem. But because he has made, there are no mistakes in this room. And so how you show up, how you engage, how you operate, how you think, and it's all shaped by, by experiences and, and life. But I want you to know as an image bearer, there are no mistakes. He has made every nationality. Think of a nationality. Yep, God's idea. To live over the whole earth. And so it's not just Jerusalem. It's not just Judea. It's not just Samaria, but it's the ends of the earth. He has made and has determined. So, so no accident, no whoopsie. He has determined. It's, it's this language of like he's gone, listen, before I speak everything into existence, here's the plan. Do you know that God knows your entire life? He knows your entire life. Like everything that, that, that has happened, he's, he's, he's been aware of it. He's, he, he knows it and still he sits like a father on the edge of his seat with absolute excitement of what his children are going to do. I, I don't know how to make sense of that, but it's true. He has determined their appointed times. So the fact that you live in 2024 is part of God's plan. Oh, but why can't I go to the days of... No, 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 because that was not part of his plan. Oh, but the good old days were good. No, they were good. But that was not part of his plan for you. He has determined their appointed times, and then hear this, and the boundaries of where they live. Now, I know that this great continent has been chopped up into various pieces that in, in this very room, we go, I, I didn't choose that. <laughs> this is why part of what we do is Acts 29. I love it, but it's so complex because you'll go, there's this country and this country, but on the border, there are these people who are like, but we're, we're family and we're, we're ethnically and culturally the same, but we've been told we're part of two separate countries. And it's like, well, we, the gospel can impact that. But also, in some way, we're saying that God has, for this particular time, determined that. He did this so that they might seek God. I'll read that and I'll go, like, why? Why would you do this? This is so hard. This is, it makes things so much harder to live. Why? And he says, so that they might seek God and perhaps they might reach out and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. He's not far from the Zulus. He's not far from the Tswanas. He's not far from the Afrikaans. He's not far from the old. He's not far from the young. He's not far from the South Africans. He's not far from the Egyptians. He's not far from those who live in the Middle East. No, 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 no. Because he moves through his people who have an understanding of the power of the gospel. And so that is our calling. As we remember and reflect and think upon Heritage Day, 
we also recognize the power of the gospel in this incredibly diverse context. This, I say this all the time. South Africa is probably the most diverse country in the world when you think about heritage. Just the climate alone blows my mind. This country has almost every single, like, I mean, you've got forest, you've got desert, you've, it's, it's all here. You've got ocean, you've got mountains, you've got it. And all of that shapes us and molds us, and but the gospel impacts it. And so I think of Acts 17. In moments of struggle and, and just fatigue, I think of Acts 17, but I also think of Revelation 7. I've alluded to it, but permit me to read it. Because this is how the story ends. This is our end reality. This is our eternal reality. It says, After this I looked, and there was a vast multitude of every nation, tribe, people, and language, which no one could number, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands, and they cried out in a loud voice, The point of their gathering, their point of their praise, the point of their adoration, the point of their worship was, was this. Salvation belongs to our God who is seated on the throne and to the Lamb. And so we can hope. And this reality, we can hope, we can have hope, we can stand in hope. Because you know what? Ultimately, our heritage is heaven. The culmination of all of this is heaven. And so right now, will we take those steps of obedience, believing in the power of the gospel? Paul writes, that the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. That's why many, even those in the church, can give up, can find it easier just to kind of apply their own preferences, to just say, you know what, it's too hard to figure out how to do this and to navigate through history and pain and trauma and to try to figure out what are the good things in this particular culture and then to embrace and enjoy foolishness to those who are perishing but to those who are being saved it's the power of the gospel and so Father God would you make us a people who believe in the power of the gospel would you cause us Lord to get out of the way that so many times we find ourselves stepping in places that we should not that all of us are in desperate need of a savior. And in your creative genius, you have found ways, different ways, vast ways, just incredibly beautiful ways to communicate that to all of us. Not just in this time, but throughout history. And yet you are leading us all to the same place where we will all be before the throne on our knees worshipping you and, and maybe for a moment maybe maybe for a moment just because you cause it to be so we'll get to look around the room and recognize that God you have always been on a rescue mission forming a family for yourself a family for yourself a family for yourself from all people And I can't wait to hear the testimonies of how you worked, God, in the lives of people, especially where people were like, there is no hope and there is no way, and yet the power of the gospel makes a way. So God, would you continue to pluck people out of darkness into your marvelous light? Would you continue to move people from being orphans to becoming children of your kingdom? And may we live as free people. Because whom the Son sets free is free indeed in all the heritage that we have. We are loved more than we could ever imagine. Let that be true today for every single person who's gathered here. We love you. 
We praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.